Deputy Pauline Tully. Right, okay. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and, and I uh, want to welcome all our guests here this morning and thank them for the presentations. And I can just say that everything that's been put forward here today is so positive um, and I think worth, you know, um, reaching out to other educational uh, institutions as well to provide something similar where that's not happening. And I know a lot of institutions are now becoming more aware of their responsibility to be inclusive. Um, so I just, I suppose I'm wondering then, um, you know, to, to what aspect you know if that's happening. So just to go to Trinity, first of all, um, first of all, I know Hugo, you said, I think, did you say 20 people are participating or is it 20 per year in, in the course that you're offering? 10 people, 10 people per year, per year. year course, yeah. Okay. And are you aware of other institutions, other educational institutions that are offering something similar in the country at the moment? Um, yeah, there, well, there, there is a national organisation that we helped to set up called INHEF, which is the uh, higher education uh, organisation. So there are a number of programmes throughout the country, but most of them, there were quite a few more, actually, believe it or not, in 2014, but quite a few uh, disappeared because of there wasn't sustainable funding. Now, the big breakthrough has been the path for access uh, program uh, developed by, by the department and that's really going to bring about next year dedicated funding for these types of programs. So we'd see this as very, very positive. This is the real breakthrough. And the other thing is this has not happened anywhere else in Europe that we're aware of because we're part of Erasmus programs. And this is the first time dedicated state funding has been there. For young people with intellectual disability to attend higher education. So that's, that's a massive breakthrough. So there are programs happening in different parts of the country. There are other colleges that want to begin the program and we've been supporting them and we've been supporting each other. Um, but it's very much an emerging area. Okay. It is not as well established but hopefully now with the proper funding and the proper infrastructure and support and we've already we received support from SOLAS for our program. So that was a recognition of the type of work we were doing. And so to me, I think you're right, this is a very positive story, but it's emerging. Mm -hmm. And it needs, the infrastructure needs to be there. So as in any part of the country, a young person, their families can begin to plan from when the youngster is about 14 years of age, that would be the ideal age for transition planning that they actually have real options. It isn't just a day service or some other parallel system where they never get into the mainstream. Yeah, I think we think that's the real prize. And mm. al although there are you know, a number of institutions, and in some cases some have, have actually ceased with the programmes, not because they, they, they thought they didn't work or maybe an individual, they were dependent on a key individual or they didn't have funding and moved on. So if you actually did a map of, of Ireland, you'd see huge gaps. Of, of, uh, at, at the moment, and that's what you know. I think what we're so excited is this is a model that works, okay. um, and, and and that's cost effective and it's transformational, and you know we'd love to work with. So sort of you'll have a map that covered all the, all the country, but that's not really that's not really there at the moment. No, no. And just on that, I suppose, it, do you engage with second level um, institutions? Like, mm -hmm. do you engage with second level schools on an ongoing basis, or how? Do students know, or how do they apply um, to actually be part of your program? Yeah, we, we have a dedicated person who's a national stroke schools coordinator, okay. Des Aston. And so we've been linking with all the career guidance sector, um, with ETBs, City of Dublin ETB and other schools. Um, it's slow work mm -hmm. because, but we've also tried, we work with uh, National Association of per, uh, Deputy Principals and Deputy Principals, so, and also the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment. So we've made contact with them all to make them aware, but all we can offer at the moment is our program. Mm. So this is why we really need to develop capacity. So as the, in anywhere in the country, we have young people, we have a young person at the moment traveling from Cork, to do our program. Mm -hmm. We have people regularly coming from Carlo, from Mullingar, from, so they're traveling wherever there's a train, mm -hmm. they're traveling up, but that's because we don't, there isn't anything there though, at loan are part of INHEF and they really want to begin a program and we would encourage that 
because we think it should be locally based, unless there's something that we're doing that they really want to do. You know. Just one last quick question on the employers. I know you said it's gone from four to forty, which is very impressive. Mm. Do you find most employers are very receptive, or are there some reticent? And if so, why? Does yeah, Marie you know, you want to take that? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, they are incredibly receptive. There has been such a shift in uh, within employment now, within companies too. They they're almost coming to us for a solution. You know, we want to be more inclusive. How do we do it? So there is a massive um, goodwill out there from companies to 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 offer opportunities to young people with additional needs, and you know, to, to offer them a career path. And we work, myself and Barbara, work very, very closely with every employer um, once they are a partner to make sure they're, they feel ready. And that's the key. We want everyone to have a positive experience and positive support network behind them. So, you know, Barbara has such expertise um, in, <laughs> she does, um, in uh, you know, in how to prepare the young person and also what supports are needed within the organisation. But you know, really, there is a massive, um, a massive desire from um, the employment sector to be more inclusive. They just want, I guess, the structures on how they can do it, and um, so we can support them to an extent for our cohort, um, and, and and we've had huge success so far. Do you have questions for others, but maybe you want me to wait and come back in, or do you? One quick one, and then we'll, we'll one quick question. And we'll... Okay, I suppose just to go to Fiona on um, what you're doing, I think it's it's very, very uh, impressive. And I'm just wondering, like I welcome the guidance that you've produced. I'm wondering, again, are other um, further ed education and, uh, and training or universities doing what you're doing? Are they coming to you for guidance? Are they using the guidance you've prepared? Um, are they reaching out for advice? Yeah, so the, the guidance is really the, um, the the research. So it's the eight principles of an autism-friendly university. Um, the, it is run through, I suppose, as I am, and also GCU. So since we have, I suppose, in the last two years, um, some other colleges, universities have joined the network to become autism-friendly, which means referring to these principles as their benchmark of good practice. Um, for example, Dundalk, IT, Sligo, TU, Royal College of Surgeons, they have joined the network, so that means that they are also referring to the research principles of what makes um, a university or a higher education autism-friendly. 